ladies and gentlemen, this morning we, uh, we welcomed a number of uh, leaders who um, uh, spoke here this morning at the Munich Security Conference for the first time. It is now my uh, pleasure to welcome someone back to this stage who has spoken here, I think, practically it, each and every single year that I've had the uh, responsibility for organizing this conference. Uh, I'm speaking about the uh, Foreign Minister of the Russian Federation, uh, Minister Lavrov, dear Sergei. Uh, we are running out of time this morning, so I'm not going to make a long introductory speech. I'm simply offering the, you the floor, please. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, today when international relationships are going through turmoil and denying the statement about the end of history, we need to remember the events of the recent past. As the Russian historian Vasily Kluchevsky said, history punishes those who do not learn the lesson. Eighty years ago, in 1938, here in Munich, we adopted the agreement on the separation of Czechoslovakia, which was a sort of a prelude to the Second World War. And later, the Nuremberg process, the leaders of the Third Reich, who were tried, claimed that the goal was to push Russia out of Europe. And Wilhelm Keitel mentioned that. The Munich tragedy reflected all the painful points of the epoch. That is the belief in their exclusiveness, the strife, the mutual suspicions, and their bet to create the sanitary quarters and buffer zones, and meddling into other states' affairs. Those memories are even more worrisome if we, we would compare them with today, with the attempts to mar them historic truth of the Second World War and the preceding events, the attempts to rehabilitate the Nazis and their allies. In certain countries of the EU, they, in law, equal Nazis and their allies and the liberators of Europe. They demolish the monuments dedicated to those who defeated fascism. The Second World War and the problems on the continent afterwards should have convinced the peoples of the lack of alternative to building a common European home without dividing people into our own and enemies. The integrational project of the EU goes back to the founding fathers wanting to avoid the relapse of the confrontational logic which led many times to a catastrophe. Over the course of many years after the fall of the Berlin War, after the unification of Germany, where Russia played a decisive role, we wanted to do our best in order to create in the Euro-Atlantic the architecture of equal and indivisible security. We have significantly reduced our military capabilities on our Western fronts, and we were supporting the strengthening of the pan-European institutions, such as the OSCU, in order to define the legal structure on European security. Unfortunately, our calls for mutual dialogue the implementation of the indivisible security principle in practice were not heard. Despite them trying to convince us back in the 90s, and this fact was confirmed through the publication of the documents of the National Archive of the US, NATO is expanding to the east. There's a military buildup observed, and they are deploying their military infrastructures and they are now active in the European military theater. While well, Europe is implementing the plans to create an intermissile defense of the US system, which undermines strategic stability. And they are deliberately carrying out this propaganda, which seeks to instill this uh, confrontational attitude to Russia. And in many countries, the new role of political correctness is to either speak of our country in bad terms or to say nothing at all. So when in the West they talk about the growing influence of Russia, they make so in a negative context. This was the case in the report which was prepared for the conference. I would like to remind you, when our country was weakened and we've been passing through a period of historic challenges, 
We've heard calls coming from everywhere talking about their interest in strong Russia and their neighbor and not being set out against our core interests. Uh, the same was true as for the Eastern Partnership, uh, the EU project, and we hope that those motives would be carried out and they would not turn into Russophobia. To consider the situation in Europe for a zero-sum game mentality is dangerous, and we can now see the results. Beleaguered by an internal conflict, Ukraine in the context of preparing its um, EU accession agreement, is now faces a false choice, either you're with the West or with Russia. And deplorably, the EU, which was the guarantor of the agreement of their position and the government of the 21st of February 2014, was actually enabled to implement it, and they have um, supported the coup d'etat. And now the country with a great uh, livelihood potential with the great people are unable to manage their own country. Russia, as nobody else, wants to resolve the intra-Ukrainian crisis. The legal framework is in place. Those are the Minsk measures developed by Germany, Russia, Ukraine, France, with the participation of Donetsk and Lugansk, and adopted by the United Nations Security Council. And we should firmly adhere to that. Now the efforts in the Conta Group in the Normandy format are sabotaged by Kiev, and now at the official level they are talking of a military scenario. I know that in the EU they should be aware of the dangers of such actions. The attempts are ongoing to make this country, a neighbor of um, the EU and Russia or the Balkans, to choose between the West and the East. In the German newspaper, there was an article, the EU or Putin, who will get Western Balkans? This is not a singular case of how they try to influence the public opinion to turn them into philosophy or our enemy or for our own. The mechanism with the EU, the summits, the partnership institutions, and the bet to put pressure on us on uh, others has not made our continent more secure. The conflict potential is growing and the crises are seen all over. The events in the Middle East and Northern Africa show that the Western enforced course to change the unwanted regimes and enforced model of development not only lead to a global chaos in the region, but actually fire back by the import of real threats into Europe. First of all, a surge in international terrorism and waves of illegal migration and everything that is connected with it. All the aforementioned should be taken into account to understand the genesis of the current relationships between Russia and the EU. Their development on the mutual beneficial basis has been a goal of our country and we've um, exerted efforts. But the task of actually building a strategic partnership, a firm partnership which would guarantee the mutual raise in um, ability to compete is not yet implemented, and it's not our fault. Over the course of the last decade, we have not found the golden middle in terms of dealing with other country. In the 90s, they believed that Russia were a kind of a pupil who should be tutored according to Western standards. Now there's this irrational myth about this global Russian threat and the traces of which are found anywhere, from Brexit to the Catalan referendum. However, both stereotypes are mistaken and they bespeak of the lack of common sense and understanding of our country. We also underscore that at the EU we see a rising number of those who are ill at ease due to the abnormal situation in our relationships. And credible experts are now acknowledging that the demonstration of unity on the Russian track costs um, the EU the diplomatic paralysis. We have not changed our approaches to our cooperation with the EU. We would like to see it strong and rooted in the core interests of their members. They should define how to develop their own economies and their external economic ties. For example, how to ensure that uh, their needs uh, in energy are being met out of um, their own decisions or influenced by others. I hope that they would be responsible, and I would like to highlight it autonomous in international affairs. I've paid um, 
uh, um, attention to Wolfgang's interview to Built newspaper where he talks about the need to raise the foreign policy profile of the EU. We believe that his idea for the need to cooperate between Russia, the EU, and the US to create the security architecture in the Middle East is um, very appreciated. And the same is true for the Gulf. We want to have a predictable European Union, a strong European Union, which would be a responsible player in foreign policy on the global scale. And we see this formation now. We should not try to pedal against the flow of history. And we should make the system of global relationship just with the central role of the United Nations. As this role is enshrined in its charter, we are open to an equal, mutually respectful dialogue based on common interests with the EU to find the answers to the global challenges of today. The very same principles should be the basis of our relationships with the US and all the other countries. We should properly tap into the potential of the cooperation between the EU and Russia to create a common space of peace, equal and indivisible security, and mutually beneficial economic cooperation. In the strategic plan, I would like to draw your attention to Mr. Putin's initiatives about the grand uh, Eurasian projects, where we would see the accumulation of the efforts in the CIS, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and I guess that the EU should get engaged in this work, starting with establishing professional contacts with the Eurasian Economic Union. I hope this is not in the far future. Thank you for your attention. We have time uh, again for a few questions. Uh, the next speaker is already in the uh, in the hall. General McMaster, welcome. Um, and um, can I have some hands? Who would like to uh, uh, ask a first question? I'm looking for people who have not yet had a chance to speak. Ed Lucas, over there, please. Mr. Foreign Minister, I just wondered what your reaction is to the um, indictments that were published yesterday in the United States that shows $1.25 million a month um, of Russian taxpayers' money being spent in trying to influence the American election. Do you think that was, a, do you see a good return on that investment? <laughs> you know, I have no response. You can publish anything, and we see those indictments multiplying, the statements multiplying. And I've also read the statement from uh, Madame Manfra. I believe that is correct. She is the advisor to the Homeland Security Head in the US, who denied the reports that any country has influenced the election results. And the same was said by Mike Pence, just recently here, or maybe in uh, another European capital. So until we see the facts, everything else is uh, just blabber. I'm sorry for this expression. There was a question. Oh, yes, yes, please. And, and please identify yes. yourself. M yeah, Michael Gala, European Parliament. Minister, you argued that the European Union um, put the members or the states of the Eastern neighborhood into an alternative either to go with Russia or with the EU. Uh, would you accept, uh, if you look at the facts, that we have very different degree of um, uh, relations with these six countries? Azerbaijan and Belarus do not want to, to sign a comprehensive deal with us. Armenia, under your pressure, decided to opt for the uh, customs Union, and so we are deciding to have a lower level treaty, and the other three actually decided to have for uh, to opt for a comprehensive approach so wouldn 't you agree that we definitely react to their wishes and that it 's not that we are imposing anything and after all, if somebody doesn 't sign a treaty with us, we are not sending tanks. 
this is how you come up with this so-called Russian threat. You started your question with a statement that I have said that Eastern Partnership is used to separate those countries from Russia. I said when it was formed, we were being assured that it wouldn't be aimed against Russia, and I hoped that those statements would be true and would be implemented, that some of the countries you mentioned wanted the Eastern Partnership to be used like that, and that's all. Uh, uh, asking Stefan Cornelius to ask a question. Allow me to ask a question myself. Uh, Sergey, you um, referred to, and thank you, to uh, the text in Bild Zeitung about uh, uh, the, which I made uh, on the US and Russia and uh, others um, working together in the Middle East. What would it take from the Russian point of view to uh, organize in a sy more systematic manner a kind of a regional security architecture in a region that is beset by so many crises. What would it take? First of all, to acknowledge that all countries in the, in the region have their legitimate interests there. Iraq, Egypt, undoubtedly, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, and other countries of the Gulf, including Iran. And not to try to approach those issues solely from the point of view of geopolitical games, either West versus Russia or the West versus Iran, or everyone wants to be together with Turkey but want Turkey to behave differently. And of course, we cannot approach those issues from an even more dangerous crossroads, and by crossroads I mean uh, the conflict in the Middle East, inside the Middle East, and to try to resolve the issues in the region through heightening the tensions between the Sunnis and the Shias, I believe that is highly dangerous. The group of people that Wolfgang mentioned in his interview, representing the US, Russia, the EU, China, this is the combination of external actors who can influence all the parties in this or that manner. Some talk to one group of protagonists, others talk to other groups of protagonists, but all together, and if we add the leaders of the Arab League together, they form a kind of an external mechanism which could influence the situation on the ground. And if we, this would be the case, if we manage that, we can draft some proposals which would be based on um, the Helsinki process, those um, confidence building measures, this is military transparency, the invitations to to attend military exercises and military briefings. I guess it wouldn't be all that difficult to start with that, but now it's important to convince the antagonists that the external actors are not going to support those conflicts based on ethnic or religious divisions. So we are ready to take part in it any time. Last question goes to Stefan Cornelius of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, back there. Thank you. Foreign Minister, um, in the, at the beginning of your speech, you were referring to tendencies in Europe you presumably see of um, sort of Nazi revisionism and uh, sort of a return of uh, the ghostly figures from the past. Could you actually explain what you mean and who you mean? What I mean is the allies of Nazi criminals who were sentenced by the Nuremberg trial are continued to be celebrated in a number of countries, including in the EU countries. We are aware that in certain countries in the north of the EU, there are rallies being held in support of the neo-Nazis. We know that the symbols of neo-Nazis are being actively used uh, in Ukraine, for example. The Azov Battalion symbol does match the SS symbols. 
And we're not talking about symbols and emblems, although such marches are very symbolic, and I guess that many in Europe do remember what it might lead to. But this manner of behavior, behavior to try to destroy everything non-radical, to Ukrainize all areas of life, and them wanting to deny the right to study in your own language with regards to national minorities, and the ban on the unwanted media, the assaults on the Russian Orthodox churches. Those are the traits for the radical nationalists, and they are tinged with neo-Nazi hue. So I guess everyone present here do follow how the situation in Europe unfolds, and they are quite aware of what I'm talking about. Thank you very much, Sergei. Let's uh, give a hand of applause to the Russian Foreign Minister. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. for coming each year. You're, you're really